the Columbia Workshop. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight the Columbia Workshop presents the eighth program of a series devoted to experimental radio. Some months ago, Mr. Wells produced Shakespeare's Macbeth for the Federal Theater. It was received with the most enthusiastic response accorded Shakespearean production in years. He is now busily engaged rehearsing for one of the leading roles in Sidney Kingsley's new play, Ten Million Ghosts, and also producing his own version of a French farce called Horse Eats Hat. Between both rehearsals, he has managed to write a book called Everybody Shakespeare. We have asked Mr. Wells to arrange and produce Shakespeare's Hamlet for the workshop. He will also play the leading role. But first a word from Mr. Wells. In deciding to present an abbreviated version of Hamlet, the Columbia workshop found itself facing a considerable dilemma. Would it be feasible, we wondered, to give merely the plot in our short space of time, or should we concentrate on certain well-known passages and let the story proceed confusingly? Our final decision was this, to present to you the first two acts of the play, retaining, whenever possible, the most notable scenes in their entirety, and giving you, we hope, a clear, dramatic statement of the causes of Hamlet's tragedy. Hamlet by William Shakespeare. It is midnight, and before the castle of Elsinore, a sentry stands at his foot. Hey, on for me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo? He. You come most carefully upon your hour. It's now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. This relief, much thanks. It's bitter cold. I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not about staring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand ho! Who's there? Friends to the crown. And liegemen to the dame. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What, has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. Horatio says it's without fantasy. And will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore, I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, <laughs> tush, twill not appear. Sit down a while. And let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story what we have two nights seen. Well, sit we down. And let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illume that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself... Please, break me off! Look, where it comes again. Same figure like the king that's dead. Shall I strike at it with my partisan? No, it will not stand. It's here. It's here. It is gone. And we do it wrong, being so majestical, to offer it sure violence. It was about to speak when the cock crew. And then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. But look, the morn, russet mantle clad, walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. Break we our watch up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit, dumb to us, will speak to him. In the great hall of the castle, the court is assembled. Hamlet, a sober figure in black, stands apart from the rest. On a day sits the king with his newly wedded queen. Suddenly a trumpet blares forth. And the king rises. Oh, yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death the memory be green. And that it us be fitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. That so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere with a defeated joy, with one auspicious and one dropping eye, taken to wife. Nor have we here in board your better wisdom, which have freely gone with us to fare along. For all our thanks. <laughs> But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son... A little more than kin. 
left and find. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I'm too much in the sun. Good Hamlet. Cast thy knighted color off. Let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lid. Seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest is common. All that live must die, passing through nature to eternity. I know. It is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam. Nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, together with all forms, shows, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might pray. But I have that within which passeth show. These with the trappings and the suits of woe. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father, that father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. A true persever in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire. And we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come, this gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet is smiling to my heart. Come away. <laughs> This too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Now that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on it. It is an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this. But two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. So loving to my mother that he might not between the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why, she would hang on him, as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet within a month, a little month or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe, all tears. Why, she, even she, ah, God, peace that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, there yet the salt of those most unrighteous tears that left the flushing in her gallant eyes, she married. Ah, most wicked speed. To post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not though it cannot come to good, but break my heart. Or I must hold my tongue. Hail to your lordship. I am glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. The same, my lord. And your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. And what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Oh, Marcellus. My good lord. Bernard, I'm very glad to see you. Good evening, sir. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? The lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray thee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio, the funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven or ere I'd seen that day, Horatio. My father. Methinks I see my father. Oh, where, my lord? 
In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father? Two nights together at these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch, in the dead, vast, and middle of the night, being thus encountered. A figure, like your father, armed at point exactly cap a pay, appears before them, and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. This to me, in dreadful secrecy, in part they did. And I, with them, the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good, the apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? Lord, on the platform where we watched. It's very strange. Indeed, my honored lord, it's true. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but this troubled me. I'll do the watch tonight. We do, me lord. I'll answer you. Arm, my lord. From top to toe. Me lord, from head to foot. I will watch tonight. A chance to walk again. I warrant it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. So fare you well at once. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our duty to your honor. My father's spirit in arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise. Though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. Uh, yeah, by truly. It's very cold. The nipping in an eager air. What are now? I think it lacks of twelve. Oh, no, it is struck. Indeed? I heard it not. Then draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to walk. What did this mean, my lord? Oh, the king doth wake tonight and takes his rouse, and as he drains his drafts of Rhenish down the kettle drum and trumpet, doth bray out the triumph of this pledge. That's the custom. Aye, there it is. But to my mind, though I am native here, and to the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. What, my lord? It comes. Angels and ministers of grace. Defend us! Be thou a spirit of health, a goblin damned. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. No oh, answer me! Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hurted in death, have burst their settlements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly inurned hath oped its ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean? Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? It waves you to a more remove it round. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why? What should be the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee. It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. Be ruled. You shall not go. My faith cries out and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called. Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that left me. I say, away! Go on! I'll follow thee. Whither wilt thou lead me? Speak. I'll go no further. Not me. I will. My hour is almost come. When I, to selfless and tormenting flame, must render up my self. Alas, poor ghost. Believe me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak. I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, <sighs> doomed for a certain term to walk the night. And for the day, confined to fast in fire, till the foul crime done in my days of nature 
are burnt and purged away. List, list, oh, list. If thou didst ever thy dear father love. Oh, God! Revenge this foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder, most foul, as in the sense it is. But this most foul, strange, and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. Now, Hamlet, here, sleeping within my altar, my custom always of the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole, with juice of cursed heaven and in a vial, and in the porches of mine ears, did pour the leprous distillment, whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man, that with a sudden vigor, it that pocket the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine, but was I sleeping, by a brother's hand, of life, of crown, of queen, as once this past. Horrible, horrible, most horrible. If thou hast nature in thee, fear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned insect. Fare thee well at length. The glowworm shows the metal to be near and begins to pale his ineffectual fire. Adieu, adieu, Hamlet, remember me. Remember me, I thou poor ghost. My memory holds a seat in this distracted gloom. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation? What it should be, more than his father's death, that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both, that being of so young days brought up with him, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time. So by your companies, to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he much hath talked of you. And sure I am to men that are not living, to whom he more adheres. We here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet to be commanded. Thanks, Guildenstern, and gentle Rosencrantz. And I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. The heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye. Amen. My liege and madam. And now what says Polonius, our Lord Chamberlain? He tells me, dear Gertrude, that he hath found the hidden source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it no other than the main. His father's death and our raw hasty marriage. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time, or nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, uh, for to define true madness, what is to be nothing else but uh, mad, uh, but let that go. More matter, with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad, tis true, tis true, tis pity, and uh, pity tis, tis true. And now remains that we may find out the cause of this effect, or rather say, the cause of this defect. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks four hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. And look. Well, sadly, the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you, both away. I'll board him presently. Oh, give me leave. How does my good lord handle it? Well, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent. Well, you're a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. 
than I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? Why, sir, to be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of 10,000. Of what did you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What is the matter, my lord? Between who? I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Slander, sir, for the satirical rogue says here that old men have gray beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging, thick amber and plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with most weak hands. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? I am to my grave. Yeah, indeed, that is out of the air. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. My honorable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. Except my life. Except my life. Except my life. Fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. You go to seek the Lord Hamlet. There he is. God save you, sir. My honored lord. Oh, my. My most dear lord. Good friends. How dost thou gild it? Then, ah, Rosencrantz, what makes you at Elsinore? Uh, to visit you, me lord. No other occasion. Beggar that I am, I'm even poor in thanks. But I thank you. Are you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come. Come. I may speak. What should we say, my lord? Well, anything but to the purpose. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. Uh, to what end, my lord? That you must teach me. Or oh, by the right of our fellowship, be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen moat no feather I have of late. But... Wherefore, I know not lost all my mirth, for gone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory, this most excellent canopy, the air. Look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof, fretted with golden fire, why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. Oh, what a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculty. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world. The paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. <laughs> no, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. Oh, my lord, there was no such stuff in my voice. Why did you laugh then when I said man delights not me? Uh, to think, me lord, if you delight not in man, what lent and entertainment the players shall receive from you. We coated them on the way, and hither are they coming to offer you services. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. There are the players. Ah, your hands then. Come, you're welcome. But my uncle, father, and aunt, mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north, northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. Well be with you, gentlemen. Mark you, Gildenstern, and you too, Rosencrantz. That great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling clouts. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the player's market. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Rochus was an actor... Oh, the role. actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz, the best buzz. actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral, comical, historical, pastoral, a tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, pastoral, scene, individable, or poem unlimited. Uh, you are welcome, master. I am glad to see thee well. Come. Come, we'll have a speech straight. Give us a taste of your quality. Come. A passionate speech. What speech, my lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted, or if it was, not above once. The play I remember pleased not the million, just caviar to the general. One speech in it I chiefly loved was Neus' tale to Dido. If you live in your memory, begin at this line and we'll see. Uh, see, the rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast. No, not so. It begins with Pyrrhus, the rugged Pyrrhus, he who sable arms, so proceed you. The rugged Pyrrhus, he who sable arms, black as his purpose, did the night resemble. When he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now his this dread and black complexion steer with heraldry more dismal. Say on, come to Hecuba. But who, oh, who had seen the Moblet Queen? The Moblet Queen. That's good, the Moblet Queen is good. Run barefoot up and down. A clout upon that head, where late the diadem stood, and for a robe, a blanket, in the alarm of fear caught up. 
But if the gods themselves did see her, then when she saw Pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs, the instant burst of clamor that she made would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. Look, whether he has not turned his color and has tears in his eyes, pray you, no more. That is well. I'll have thee speak out the rest soon. Good, my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Come, sir. Follow him, friend. We'll hear a play tomorrow. <laughs> Now I'm alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in suspect, a broken voice and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit. For nothing. For Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him? Uh, he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech. Yet I, a dull and muddy metalled rascal, eat. Like John of Green, I'm pregnant of my cause and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks me pay to cost, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this, huh? Soon as I should take it, for it cannot be that I am pigeon-livered and lack call to make oppression bitter. For ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with its slaves. Oh, rocky body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance! Why, what a mess. This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a board unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very trap. A scullion. Fie upon it, fie. About my brain. I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul but presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before my uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tend him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy. And he is very potent with such spirits abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Ladies and gentlemen, the Columbia Workshop offers its 15th program in a series devoted to experimental radio. Some two months ago, we offered you on the workshop a radio version of the first two acts of Samuel by William Shakespeare. The response from our listening audience was instantaneous and highly flattering. So much so that tonight we go on to finish the play. If you enjoy the drama, if you believe after tonight's performance that Shakespeare should become a regular feature on radio, write to us and say so. We are eager to have this gauge of radio public opinion. Tonight's version of Hamlet, like that of some weeks ago, is the work of Orson Welles, who also plays the role of Hamlet. And now we take pleasure in introducing to you in person, Mr. Orson Welles. In our previous broadcast, we concerned ourselves with establishing the causes that led to Hamlet's tragedy. 
in especial the revelation by the ghost of his father's murder, by Hamlet's own uncle, who is now the king of Denmark. This, and the knowledge that his mother had remarried immediately, has left Hamlet a creature mad for revenge. Assuming, as he calls it, an antic disposition, Hamlet plots to trap the king into an open confession of guilt. The arrival of strolling players at the court has provided the necessary means. Hamlet arranges that a performance be given, duplicating the circumstance of his father's death. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. It is the night of the play. The hall of the castle has been arranged for the performance. And in a moment, the court will assemble. The blare of trumpets will announce the arrival of the king and queen with Polonius, the king's counselor, and his daughter, Ophelia. In a moment, this play of Hamlet's contriving will begin. But now, for an instant, we find him giving some last-minute advice to the players. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as least the town crier spoke my lines. Now do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus. But use all gently. I warrant, Your Honor. Oh, be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Oh, there be players that I have seen play, but neither having the accent of Christians, nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. <laughs> I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir. Oh, reform it altogether. <laughs> Go, you make ready. Horatio. Yes, sweet lord. At your service. There is a play tonight before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I have told thee of my father's death. Observe, mine uncle. Well, my lord. Oh, he's coming to the play. Get your place. Your majesty. How oh, fares our cousin Hamlet? Excellent, to faith, of the chameleon's dish. I eat the air, promise crammed. You cannot feed capons, so... I have nothing but this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, no, mine, no. Uh, Polonius, are the players ready? Aye, my lord, they stay upon your patience. Uh, sit you there, Ophelia. Fair Ophelia. You are merry, my lord. What should a man do but be merry? For look you, how cheerfully my mother looks. And my father died within these two hours. Nay, it is twice two months, my lord. So long. Ah, we shall know by these fellows. For us and for our tragedy, here stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. <laughs> Full thirty years times hath Phoebus' cart gone round, Neptune's salt wash, and Pellis all the ground. Since love our hearts and Hymen did our hands, unite commutual in most sacred bands. So many journeys, neither sun and moon, they can again come over. Their love be done. Faith, I must leave thee, love. And shortly, too, thy offering powers their functions leave to do. And thou shalt live. Oh, confound the rest! Such love must needs be treason in my breast. And second husband, let me be a curse. None wears the second, but who kills the first. Wormwood. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, but die thy thoughts when thy first lord is dead. Both here and hence pursue me lasting strife. If once a widow ever I be wife. Tis deeply sworn. Sweet, leave me here a while. Thy spirits grow dull, and fain I would beguile a tedious day with sleep. Sleep rock thy brain. And never come this charge between us friends. <laughs> Madam, how like you this play? The lady does protest too much, methinks. Oh, she'll keep her word. What do you call the play? 
The mousetrap. Very how? Topically, this play is the image of a murder done in Vienna. Horse, black, hands, apt, drugs, fit, and time. This one is Luciana's nephew to the king, see? He poisons him in the garden for the state. His name's Gonzago. The story is extensive, written choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. Give all the play! What? Write it with false fire! Is now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Soft. Now to my mother. realization that his crime has been reenacted before the entire court under the guise of an evening's entertainment has completely unnerved the king. He sees there can be no peace for him while Hamlet remains in Denmark. So in a desperate move, he arranges that Hamlet shall be sent to England and secretly put to death. In his chamber, the king, torn by conscience, attempts to pray. Hamlet, passing on his way to the queen's apartment, observes the kneeling figure. How might I do it, Pat? Now he is praying. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Help angels, make us say. Bow stubborn knees. All may be well. And now I have to toil. So he goes to hell. So am I revenged. This is higher in salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly full of bread with all his crimes, broad flown, as flush as may. Am I then revenged to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No. Not sort. No, thou art more hardy bent. When he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, at gaming, swearing, or about some act that hath no relish of salvation in then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned as black as hell, whereto it goes. My mother stays. Who's there? Ernest. Hamlet is coming straight. Now look, you lay home to him. Tell him his promise has been too broad to bear. Mother! I hear him coming. I'll hide behind this heiress. I'll convey myself to hear the process. Now, mother! What's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Why, how now, Hamlet? Have you forgotten me? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen. Your husband's brother's wife. Would it were not so? You are my mother. Nay, then I'll set those tears that can speak. Come, come and sit you down, <laughs> son of Budge. You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What will that do? That will not matter me. Help! Help! Oh, help! Help! How oh, now? A rat? Dead for a ducky! Dead! Oh, I am slain. <laughs> Nay, I know not. It's the king. Oh, what a rash and bloody deed. A bloody deed. Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. Kill a king? Aye, lady. Was my word. Oh, you Thou wretched rash, intruding fool. Farewell. I took thee for thy better. Oh. 
Leave wringing of your hand. Please sit you down and let me wring your heart. Or so I shall if it be made of penetrable stuff. If damned custom have not brassed it so that it be proof and bulwark against sense. What have I done? That thou dost wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me. Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love, and sets a blister there. I me what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? Look here. Upon this picture, and on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. He. What a grace was seated on this brow. Hyperion's curls. The front of Jove himself. An eye like Mars to threaten and command. A station like the Herald Mercury, new lighted on a heaven-kissing hill. This was your husband. <laughs> Look you now. What follows? Here is your husband. Like a mildewed ear. Blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and fatten on this moor? Huh? Have you eyes? You cannot call it love. For at your age, the hate and the blood is tame, it's humble. It waits upon the judgment, and what judgment would step from this to this? Oh, heaven, speak no more. Thou turnest mine eyes into my very soul. And there I see such black and grainy spots as will not leave their teeth. A murderer and a villain, a slave that is not twentieth part the tithe of your preceding lord, a king of shreds and patches. <laughs> And hover on me with your wings, you heavenly gods. What would your gracious figure? <laughs> Do you not come, your tardy son, to chide? Alas, how is it with you that you do bend your eye on vacancy? Why, look you there. Look how it steals away. My father, in his heaven, he lived. Look where he goes, even now, out of the portal. This is the very coinage of your brain. Mother, for love of grace, lay not that flattering unction to your soul. But not your trespass, but my madness speaks. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption, mining all within, infects unseen. Confess yourself to heaven. Oh, Hamlet, thou hast left my heart in twain. Oh, throw away the worser part of it and live the purer with the other half. Good night. But go not to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. When you are desirous to be blessed, I'll bless him, they give you. So again, good night. I must be cruel, only to be kind. Be thou assured, if words be made of breath and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must to England. You know that. Alack, I had forgot. You're so confused, on. Good night, mother. Thus, Hamlet leaves his mother, hoping his words have had the desired effect. But the queen, after her son's converse with an unseen spirit, is now more convinced than ever that Hamlet is mad. She reports her conclusions to the king, who speedily commands that Hamlet shall leave at once for England. And so Hamlet is banished from Denmark. But the peace for which the king has prayed is not to come. The murder of Polonius proves the mainspring of greater and more tragic events. 
bereft of a father, Ophelia goes insane. The Danish people are stirred almost to rebellion. And finally, with the return of Laertes, the son of Polonius, they are provided with a necessary leader. Now the rabble has risen, and led by Laertes, storms the castle in which the king and queen have secluded themselves. Suddenly, the doors break open, and Laertes appears at the head of the mob. Where is the king? Sir, send you all without order. I pray you, if they leave, keep the door. Oh, thou vile king, give me my father. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. I am guiltless of your father's death. The shall as level to your judgment, Pierce, as day does to your rye. Oh, no. What noise is that? Majesty of Denmark. How do you, pretty lady? Well, God old you. Ha, they say the owl was a baker's daughter. <laughs> oh, heat dry up my brains. Tis yeah. seven times salt to burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. Dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia. Oh, heaven, is possible a young maid's wit should be as mortal as an old man's life. Rosemary, that's for remembrance. There's room for you, and here's some for me. Ah, we may call it air we grace for Sunday. Oh, you must wear your rule with a different. I would give you some violets, but they will it all when my father died. Ah, God have mercy on his soul, and on all good Christian souls, I pray God. Love me, William. Oh. 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 And so Ophelia, before her brother's eyes, drifts from the castle to die. A suicide by drowning. Meantime, Hamlet, unaware of what has happened in his absence, has managed to escape the king's plot to have him murdered and has secretly returned to Denmark. We find him once more with Horatio in a churchyard. Nearby, a grave digger sings at his work. Has this fellow no feeling of his business, Horatio? With his sings and grave making? Custom that made it in him the property of easiness. I would speak to this fellow. Whose grave is this, sir? Mine, sir. Or a pit of clay for to be made. Oh, I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in it. And you lie out on, sir, therefore it is not yours. For my part, I do not lie in it, and yet it is mine. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in? One that was a woman, but rest her soul, she's dead. How absolute for nay, this Horatio. How long hast thou been a grave maker? Of all the days of the year... I came to it that day our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? Can it you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the very day young Hamlet was born. He that's mad and sent into England. Aye, Mary. Why was he sent into England? Because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there. <laughs> or if he do not, there's no great matter there. There the men are as mad as he. How long will a man lie in the earth, Harry Rod? Eh, hey, sir, if he be not rotten before he die, he lasts you some eight or nine year. Here's a skull now. This skull have lain to the earth three and twenty years. Whose was it? A whoresome mad fellow as it was. This same skull, sir, was Yorick's skull, the king's jester. This. Even that. Let me see. Oh, yes. Poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest. Of most excellent fancy. He has borne me on his back a thousand times. No. 
how hard in my imagination it is. Where be your jibes now? Your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were one to set the table on a roar. Baby Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Does thou think Alexander looked to this fashion in the earth? In, sir. And spelt so? <sighs> to what base uses may we return, Horatio? Well, it's off to side. Here comes the king, the queen, the courtiers. Who is this they follow? Couch we while in mark. What ceremony else? That is Laertes, a very noble youth. What ceremony else? Must there no more be done? No more be done. We should profane the service of the dead to sing a requiem and such rest to her as to peace parted souls. Nay, hurry, dear. I tell thee, churlish priest, a ministering angel shall my sister be when thou liest howling. What? Perophilia? Sweet, to the sweet. Farewell. I hope thou shouldst have been my Hamlet, wife. I thought thy bride bed to have decked, sweet maid, and not have strewed thy grave. Hold off the earth a while, till I have caught her once more in my arms. What is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? This is I, Hamlet, the day! Devil, take thy soul! I loved Ophelia! Forty thousand brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum! Dost thou come here to whine, to outface me with Lethe in her grave? Oh, he is mad, Laertes! What is the reason that you use me thus? I loved you ever. But it is no matter. Let Hercules himself do what he may. The cat will mew. And dog will have his day. Now Laertes determined to be revenged finds an ally in the king. Thus the latter arranges that Hamlet and Laertes shall duel. Ostensibly for sport, the contest is treacherously conceived. Laertes' rapier bears an envenomed point, and if this fails, the king has prepared a poisoned drink to ensure the death of Hamlet. Lord, Majesty sends to know if your pleasure hold to play with Laertes. I am constant to my purposes. The king and queen are all coming down. You will lose this wager. I do not think so. But thou wouldst not think how ills all here about my heart. No matter. Your mind is like anything. Obey it. I will forestall the repair hither and say you are not fit. Oh, not of which we defy augury. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be not now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Come, Hamlet. Come and take this hand from me. Give them the foil. You know the wager. Very well, my lord. Set me the stoops of wine upon that table. The king shall drink to Hamlet's better breath. Come. Begin. Come on, sir. Come, my lord. What? No. A hit? A very palpable hit. Hey, give me drink. Hamlet, here's to thy help. Give him the cup. I'll pay this bout for Set it by a while. Come. Justice, do not drink. I will, my lord. I pray you pardon me. Tis the poison cup. It is too late. Come for the third layer, as you would dally. I pray you pass with your best violence. How about you now? Ah. A touch for Leonti. Hey, come again. Look, they have changed rapiers. Oh. Look to the queen. The oh. How does the queen? She swoons to see them. Please. No, no, the drink. The drink. I am poisoned. Oh, villainy. Let the doors be locked. Treachery, seek it out. It is here, Hamlet. Hamlet.
tablet. Thou art slain, and the treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and envenomed, thy mother's poison. I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. Point in venom, too. And venom, thy work. Oh, oh yes, defend me, friend. Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned dame. Break off this potion. Follow my mother. <sighs> you that look pale and tremble at this chance. That I but mute or audience to this act. Had I but time, oh, I could tell you. But let it be. I die, Horatio. Thou livest. Report me in my cause a right to the unsatisfied. Never believe it. I am more an antique Roman than a Dane. Is yet some little left. As thou art a man, give me the cup. Let go. Oh, oh my hand, I offer. Oh. Horatio. What a wounded name. Things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, oh. I'd sent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain. But tell my story. The rest is silence. <laughs> now, Cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. You have just heard a condensed version of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. The cast included this evening The King, played by Alexander Scorby, The Queen by Rosamund Pinchot, Polonius by Edgerton Paul, Horatio by Sidney Smith, The Ghost by George Gall, Bernardo by Harum Sherman. This program was arranged and directed by Orson Welles. Irving Beast directed the radio effect. The Columbia Workshop would appreciate your comments on this production. So ends the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Again, may we say that if you enjoy this presentation, if you are convinced that the tragedies and comedies of Shakespeare have a place on the air and should become a permanent radio feature, write to us. Help give us this gauge of public opinion. Tonight's cast included Miss Frank Hale, Miss Laura Straub, Miss Virginia Wells, Mr. Whitford Kane, Sidney Smith, Joseph Cotton, Shirley Oliver, Santos Ortega, George Duthie, Edgerton Paul, and Hiram Sherman. The narrator was Edward Jerome. Next week, the workshop will present a special demonstration in conjunction with the meeting of the New York Electrical Society. Dr. E.E. E. Free will have charge of the demonstration. Tonight's presentation of Hamlet was arranged and produced by Orson Welles. In the absence of Mr. Reese, Brewster Morgan assisted. Mm -hmm.